Hello and welcome to this London Southeast interview. And Wednesday, April the 12th, is an auspicious day for pangenomic health, which listed on the Aquas Exchange with a ticker NARA. I am delighted to be joined by the Executive Chair, Robert Nigren. So, Robert, you're already listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange. So why did you think that now was the time to introduce yourself to a UK investor base? Thank you very much for the question. There's always several reasons. Um, the obvious to attract more attention to the stock from a retail investor perspective. Same time also to bring our products into the UK and EU markets. Um, so the obvious answer of to find more audience. Okay, so you mentioned products there. So what is it that the company provides or creates? So the formation of the company was based on the idea that natural remedies have evidence over thousands of years to help heal the body. Uh, Western medicine doesn't quite take the same view and prefers pharmaceuticals, and there's nothing wrong with pharmaceuticals. But there's just so much uh, tribal knowledge and more and more evidence with respect to natural remedies ha actually helping alleviate certain conditions. Um, specifically in terms of mental health in our particular area and focus. And so the idea was to start a company that could help an individual find the solution from within their body. So we start at the DNA level and just understanding what is good for a person, what types of ingredients does an individual metabolize well, and then to present information to them. So basically a precision health platform, but not for pharmaceutical drugs, one for plant, re plant medicine remedies. So when you talk natural, tribal, plant-based remedies, you, you don't make them. You, is it the case that you harvest the intelligence out there and identify what is the best for the platform user? It, yes, it's not our products. I mean, we want to stay agnostic with respect to the dietary supplements and natural herbal remedies that are out there. Um, but just leverage the knowledge that comes from traditional Chinese medicine, from Ayurvedic medicine from India, and obviously in the West as well, there's lots of good herbal uh, knowledge in the West and to bring it together in an evidence-based, um, fact-informed approach to find out what remedies have been shown to be effective. And then like almost anything, food or drugs that we bring into our bodies reach individuals, obviously at the genetic level, DNA level, and then how we metabolize things. And so we just want a, a platform, obviously a digital health platform that will make it very, very easy for the individual consumer to find out what may work best for them. And in terms of that platform, do people go to your websites? Do you have proprietary apps and do they exist already? Yeah, it is a range. So we're coming from the approach of you need to make things simple for consumers. So simple apps are simple, websites are simple. So what amount of information can we present in an easily digestible manner for free? Um, and then that's at the, obviously the simplistic level. We don't make, make very much money when we offer it for free. Um, but then as we move deeper into interacting with the individual, the consumer, then we can bring them onto our subscription model. So the products were all built last year. They're in revenue now. Um, that's on the consumer side. So apps, websites, uh, platform to be able to access telehealth, to find the appropriate health practitioner, be it a medical doctor, a naturopath, herbalist, a botanist, we're kind of indifferent in terms of which trusted advisor the, the consumer wishes to uh, pursue. Um, and at the far other end of the spectrum, though, when you're getting a little bit off of technology, our diagnostic product, so a um, product for health practitioners, because blood has been drawn and you probably shouldn't take your own blood. Um, so the idea that a health practitioner that's part of the process of having you take natural remedies for the treatment regimen, um, for them to be able to draw blood on a monthly or bi-monthly um, sequence and look at the biomarkers to see whether the natural remedies are actually making a difference for that individual. So the science around that is getting very interesting. And then we'll move beyond blood and move into saliva and other aspects of being able to actually track whether it's working or not. So you've had a very busy year indeed. So what's the take up been like in terms of B to C, the consumers out there? Uh, just started. So we launched the product late last year in terms of the apps and we acquired another app called MindLeap in December. And we've just been spending the last three or four months working through an integration of, the, of NARA, which is our original consumer app and MindLeap and to bring the telehealth functionality in MindLeap onto our NARA platform and some things kind of vice versa. And so big marketing efforts, which everything takes marketing, um, will really get going in our starting now.
we were using the uh, the listing process in the UK as kind of a, a launch a springboard to get things started. An excellent and obvious way to market your products. But what is the size of the market? What are you trying to tap into? I always start with 8 billion people, but I know that sounds too large. Um, so I believe there are 8 billion people that hopefully can have better understanding of what's going on in their body and what's appropriate for their body. There's $117 billion spent on the category of complementary and alternative uh, medicines. So that's a key area. People are already picking their own dietary supplements and natural health products, kind of guessing, and a lot of times guessing, but it's an extremely large market. And then we overlap that with the precision medicine market. So this is where people are coming up with solutions to look at your DNA to find out how you metabolize. Uh, usually it's in the clinical research or cancer drug realm, and that's a 30 plus billion dollar market. So we're kind of combining the market of, of what can you do with your DNA in terms of better information for the consumer in the context of natural remedies, which is obviously large. It certainly is large. And I'm assuming that um, you're going to have to share it and there is competition out there. So what is it that you provide that the competition can't or doesn't? Yeah, so we come at it from, from lots of people know about 23andMe and Ancestry. So the consumer tests using your DNA and they present a broad range of information that you can learn from your, as a consumer with your 23andMe data. But we do it on the focused approach as natural remedies. So we're not here to tell you where, where, whether you're from Africa or Asia or wherever. We're not here to look into predisposition for um, cancers or other more serious illnesses to that extent. It's really in terms of anxiety, depression, and mental health conditions in which natural remedies work for that. So the, the, sequen the DNA sequencing companies we do view as competitive to the extent that they are trying to find information from your DNA. And on the other end, there are dietary supplement companies um, that are starting to not just sell you the product, but also ask, ask for your DNA as well, and then try to tailor their own product for you. Um, and that's also competitive. And then there's just a broad, broad swath of wellness and mental health apps um, with very rud not rudimentary, but basic information. And so we're trying to be extremely niche in combining all those three things of mental health, DNA, um, and in terms of getting a, a sense of wellness brought into the initial. Because I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, what's the plan for expansion? You, you've told me that you're not philanthropists, uh, you're not giving everything away for free and that you're niche. So how do you intend to maximize returns for investors? Yeah, and it is actually two parts. Um, I don't believe the UK has this form of structure, but in the US and Canada, there are public benefit corps, PBCs, and we became one of Canada's first, I think we're the second publicly listed public benefit corp last year. And in the US, there's maybe about 10 to 20. And that is significant to who we are. It means we, in our charter, in our articles, is embedded an obligation, not just to bring profits for our shareholders, but equally important is to have a social purpose. So we have a social purpose uh, framed around mental health, um, natural remedy solutions, and so for investors, we hope it taps into, and especially retail investors, we hope that our story will resonate with retail investors, specifically um, social conscious, socially conscious retail investors that are looking forward to make money, number one. Everybody likes to make money. But at the same time, if they're going to make money, how do they support a company that has a social purpose? Um, and not just a high level corporate social responsibilities, which almost every corporation has a CSR policy program. But for us, it's embedded. So I hope it is our DNA that we will be trying to do things differently than just your standard for-profit corporation. Social purpose is exceptionally important at the moment. And it sounds as though you're being more than standard bearers. But you mentioned we there. So talk to me about the team you've established and why you've got two chief executives. Yeah, so I co-founded the company with a fellow named Vincent Lum, and he comes with an awful lot of medical diagnostics experience, which I do not have. Um, so that started off by myself with the vision on the mental health and natural remedies perspective and his with the med medical diagnostics. So we started it. And then you need to always beef up the team and cover off the different segments of what you're trying to do. And I do approach things from a male-female perspective. I do believe everything should be 50-50. Um, and so the idea, too many men in the room, so we need to get it to where it's more even. 
and also to bring different strengths. So we hired Miriam Marison in the fall of last year, just after we were listed in Canada. And she just brings a tremendous, tremendous amount of knowledge around natural remedies, around mental health, um, on the public relations side. And so to have that complement of, yes, one female, one male. Um, and I know that sounds like a little bit of a check mark, but it's out of 8 billion people, I'm pretty sure there's half men, half women, more or less. And so I think we should be reflective of that. Um, so they work very well together and cover off different um, different products, responsibilities, and at the same time, different thought processes in terms of how we should tackle these markets. And it brings a beautiful yin-yang element to your corporate structure. So finally, Robert, two listings now. Any plans to list on another exchange? Not yet. <laughs> I got to catch my breath for a little bit. Catch our breaths. Um, we'll see where this goes. But lots of exciting opportunities by having a cross-listing in the UK. And it's lovely having you here in the UK. Robert Nigren, Executive Chair and Co-Founder of Pan Genomic Health. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much.